Good morning. I welcome you to this session of fluid machines. Now, we will be discussing in this session mainly the governing of reaction turbines and we will solve some example on reaction turbines. Before that, I like to show you a typical plot of the efficiency of reaction and impulse turbines as a function of load applied to the turbine. Well, you see this figure, it is clear that uh, this figure in the abscissa, it is the percent of full load and this efficiency is the ordinate. As you see, this curve refers to the Pelton wheel, I can, I think you can see. Now, this, this is the Pelton wheel curve, this is the propeller turbine, this is the Francis turbine, this is the Kaplan turbine. Now, here of course, you may have a question. Let us say propeller turbine and Kaplan turbine are different. Usually, in practice, we refer to a turbine whose entry is mainly radial and tangential, but exit is purely axial to that of a Kaplan turbine. We refer to that as Kaplan turbine, this one for Kaplan turbine. And we refer to a propeller turbine when the entire flow through the turbine is axial. axial. And this type of turbine have got vanes or blades which are similar in nature to the propeller of a ship and they are very less in numbers, usually 4 to 6 the number of blades, these are propeller turbine, this is purely axial turbine. So, you see from this curve, this give you an idea that how the efficiency varies. You see the Pelton turbine gives almost a very high efficient with a, in a wider range of load. So, therefore, Pelton turbine in this respect, we can tell is a flexible with respect to the variation in the load that it operates at a fairly high efficiency during a wider range of load. This is not so in case of Francis turbine or propeller turbine, it attains almost a maximum efficiency at certain load and then a change in load uh, makes or decreases the efficiency, there is a drop in efficiency in either side. However, the Kaplan turbine is, is compromised between these two that it is almost like Pelton turbine is efficiency and does not fall in this side, the, that means beyond a certain load you see that it fairly, it operates at a fairly high efficiency. Now, after that, I will show you another curve, this is a propeller, this is propeller turbine, P R O P E L L E R. this is Pelton, this is the propeller one, this one is the Pelton, this is the Kaplan turbine and this one is the <coughs> Francis turbine. Now, after that, I will show you another very interesting plot uh, is the plot between the efficiency and the dimensional dimension less specific speed. These are the efficiency values. This is uh, I think uh, 0 0.82, 0 0.86, 0 0.90, 0 0.94, 0 0.98, 0 0.82, this is the, this is a typical plot, 0.86, this is 0.86, this is 0 0.98, this is 0 0.94, obviously this is 0 0.90. So, you see this curve is Pelton, this curve is Francis, this curve is axial flow or Kaplan. Now, we have to recall that the specific speed dimensionless for a turbine is n p to the power half divided by rho to the power half, rho is there and g is there in dimensionless specific speed, g h to the power 5 by 4. So, we have seen that this specific speed earlier that it is a dimensionless parameter and it indicates the similarity conditions. That means, we can say that it is a similarity parameter also. And a machine of a particular homologous series has different characteristics curve as far as its variation of specific speed with the efficiency. So, this corresponds to Pelton. All Pelton turbines follow this curve. All Francis turbine follow this curve. All axial flow Kaplan turbines follow this curve. Here we see that the efficiency of the Pelton turbine is high, is in the range of 0 0.94, 94 percent when the specific speed is relatively low, which means that Pelton turbines are efficient only at low specific speed, that means at a high heat. This already we discussed earlier. So, this gives the typical ranges of the specific speed. This is one dimensionless, this is two, this is three, this is four. The next is the Francis. That means, Francis turbine operates at a relatively lower head as compared to that of Pelton turbine. So, if you operate Francis turbine at a high head, what will happen in this range? Pelton turbine will give an efficiency below 90 percent. So, it is not 
wise it is not a wise decision to choose a Francis turbine in these specific speed ranges, because Pelton turbine will be giving a higher efficiency. So, axial flow turbine on the other hand, this efficiency drops too much to lower specific speed that means higher rate, but at a higher specific speed or at a lower rate axial flow Kaplan turbine gives fairly high efficiency as compared to the Francis one or Pelton one. So, this we have discussed earlier, but in this regard immediately we can see uh, a very straightforward application of this through a problem, a straightforward application of this concept and this figure through a problem like this. Just you note this problem, it is a very straightforward and simple application of the problem which give you a clear concept in the design of the type of turbines, hydraulic turbines for a particular operation which I told you earlier, but now this gives you a clear example. A reservoir has a head of 40 meter and a channel leading from the reservoir permits a flow rate of 34 meter cube per second. Well, that means the head is available that I have this much amount of head available that is the total energy of the fluid per unit weight and the permissible flow rate that means available flow rate is 34 meter cube per second. Now, if the rotational speed of the rotor has to be 150 rpm that means rotational speed of the rotor is fixed 150 rpm what is the most suitable type of turbine to use. That means we have the operating conditions like this head 40 meter flow rate 34 meter cube per second and the rotational speed of the rotor is 150 rpm. These three are the operating conditions which are usually specified for a turbine. Now, it is a very simple uh, practical example that we have here. That means, we have to just calculate the specific speed. Let us calculate the non-dimensional or dimensional. Now, whether you will calculate the dimensional or non-dimensional depends upon the ready-made figures or ready-made uh, what is called the table is available to you that whether you have the values of the dimensionless or dimensional specific speed. So, this is the problem. So, now what we do? We have to calculate the specific speed that means n p to the power half rho to the power half g h to the power 5 by 4. So, h is given 40 meter in the problem you see rotational speed is given. So, we will have to calculate the power. What is power? Power is density flow g h. So, power developed is rho q g h. So, this can be equal to 1000 density kg per meter cube, 34 meter cube per second is q, g is 9.81 you take meter per second square and head is 40. So, therefore, we get the power developed from the available head as this one which is in what? So, this comes to be 13 point if you calculate it, it 3 4 megawatt. Now, if you calculate the specific speed dimension <coughs> then what you do n is 150 rpm you better uh, put it in rps then 13.34 into 10 to the power 6 in terms of watt it is nothing only this algebraic calculations or mathematical calculations g into h 40 whole to the power 5 by 4. Now, if you calculate it, it will come as 0 0.16 I am sorry 1000 to the power half I am sorry 1000 to the power half. If you calculate it, I am giving you the answer it will come like or in terms of revolution, this is very simple school level thing, just a straightforward application. That means, you find out the KST with the values and then you see from our earlier figure 1.037 radian, it is given in terms of radian, KST in radian. So, which one we will now, if we have this chart in our hand which one we will select? We will select Francis very good. So, answer is that Francis turbine. So, Francis we will choose. So, for this operation we will choose a Francis turbine because it runs at the higher efficiency very good. Now, I will come to 
the governing of turbine. Well, governing of turbines. Now, governing of reaction turbines, as I have told you earlier, the governing of turbines means to change the flow to the turbine accordingly with the change in the load to the turbine. When the load increases, we have to increase the liquid flow to the turbine. Similarly, when the load is decreased, we have to decrease the flow of liquid to the turbine, so that the speed of the rotor remains constant to maintain the constancy in the frequency of the electrical output. This, this is done in a reaction turbine by changing the position, gate position or changing the positions of the guide blades or the guide vanes or the wicket gates, so that the flow rate to the turbine is altered by changing the gate openings, how it is done. Now, I already told you earlier, I have already told you earlier that the wicket gates or the fixed vanes of the turbine are pivoted, so that this can be rotated, this can be moved. Now, this you see, this is the volute casing, this is volute, this is the volute casing of the turbine. This is the inlet, that means the liquid flows through this. Now, this is the turbine wicket gates, this is the rotor of the turbine. So, this wicket gates or vanes which are not shown here, they are connected through levers to a regulating ring. This circular portion, this is written here, this regulating ring. This regulating ring is connected to this regulating rod, these two sides, these are the regulating rod, these are the connecting pins. So, these regulating rods are connected to these regulating rings at one end and the other ends are connected to a regulating lever. This is a regulating lever which is keyed to a shaft. This is a typical this type of thing. This is a, I show you again that if you cannot make it, this is a regulating, this is this is the shaft. Here the regulating rods are going like this and this is keyed to a shaft which is turned by a servo motor. This is a servo motor, this is the servo motor piston which is actuated by the pressurized oil, the pressurized oil. The pressure of the oil which comes to the servo motor and actuates the piston is actually controlled by a governor mechanism. That means, that sends the pressure and in that proportion, it controls the motion of the servo motor piston which ultimately actuates or turns this uh, shaft to which this lever is keyed and ultimately through this regulating rod and through the lever mechanism which is ultimately connected to the uh, wicket gates or the static vanes of the rotor, they are shifted. That means, automatically when the load changes, the oil pressure changes and ultimately through this mechanism, the position of the gate is changed. So, that the gate openings vary and accordingly the flow liquid flow enters or the liquid flow rate entering to the turbine changes. This is the mechanism by which the governing of reaction turbine is made. Apart from that, there is another valve, another valve, bypass valve or relief valve, bypass or relief valve, bypass valve that is being used in this circuit to this along with this phenomena, along with this sorry, along with this mechanism to discharge or bypass some amount of water to a different line. That means, it is not allowed to go to the turbine. This is known as double regulation. This is known as double regulation. That means, simultaneously the flow rate is controlled through this mechanism by altering the position of the stator vents or the wicket gates along with the bypassing or changing the direction of flow or converting or bypassing certain amount of flow in other directions, not allowing them to enter to the turbine. This is known as double regulation. That depends upon the amount to which the change in the flow rate has to be made. That means, when the load changes drastically, then the double regulation is required. So, this is all about the governing of reaction turbine. Now, we will solve certain important problems, because now we have almost completed the reaction turbines. So, therefore, at the end, we like to go through certain 
important problems. So that yes, please, please. Yes, yes. Just, 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 just a moment. Let me uh, <coughs> place this diagram. Otherwise, it will be difficult for you or for me to understand other side. Efficiency versus KST diagram. Yes, please tell. This is actually the overall efficiency. <coughs> it doesn't matter. It may be hydraulic efficiency or overall efficiency. When the picture is there, you will have to take care of that. If the hydraulic efficiency is more, means for that case, overall efficiency will be also more. It is usually quoted in terms of overall efficiency. Yes. Uh, in the problem that we solved, hmm. we took the hydraulic efficiency as 100 percent because P we wrote as Q. Yes, very good. Energy. In the problem we solve, we do not know the efficiency. We have not assumed. That is a trend. It is nothing coming quantitatively correct. What we are finding out a trend that wh whether we will use which type of turbine. Here we have used the power developed. We have considered the hydraulic or overall efficiency to be 1. That means this is the power developed. So, if we use this power developed, we will be getting a KST this amount. Now, any turbine if you choose, this may be reduced because power developed may be reduced. We may add, we may make a multiplication of it out. That will not change this order of this KST. That means, we are interested to find out the ranges of the specific speed where we will tell that in this range Francis is very high. That means, we are not coming to a range where the specific speed is in the range of 0.1 or 0.2. So, it hardly matters. So, quantitatively definitely this is not the power developed, this is the power available. So, exact power developed will be multiplied by the overall efficiency. So, at the beginning a priori we are not knowing the power developed. So, therefore, we take this as the power developed. There may be some reduction that you can add, we can multiply it with 0.9, some approximate value we can take. It hardly matters, we want the range. That means, the specific speed will be in the range of 1. We can write in the range of 1 where Francis turbine is the most suitable one. That is why you have assumed it and we have straightforward written P. Definitely from the theoretical point of view, you should write here that P is this provided we assume the overall efficiency to be 100 percent. Very good, correct. Now, next problem, <coughs> next uh, stage is that we should go through certain very important problems which will give a clear idea of the Francis turbines, which we have already learned Francis and Kaplan turbine. Look into this problem. A Francis turbine has a diameter of 1.4 meter. This is the diameter of the Francis turbine, 1.4 meter. 1.4 meter is the diameter and rotates at 430 rpm. That means, the revolutionary speed or rotational speed is given. Water enters the turbine runner without shock with a flow velocity of 9.5 meter per second. This is the flow velocity and leaves the runner without whirl. That means, without any tangential component. This is usually done in the design of all runner blades that they do not have any whirling velocity. If in a problem for your uh, examination purpose does not mention that without whirl that you can assume that the outlet is without whirl and you can draw the velocity triangle at the outlet accordingly with an absolute velocity of 7 meter per second. So, this is the absolute velocity of water at the discharge. The difference between the sum of the static and potential heads, the difference between the sum of static and potential heads at entrance to the runner and at the exit from it is 62 meter. That means, it is difference of static and potential heads. You understand static and potential head that means p by rho g plus g that is the difference between the static and potential head this sum of these two quantities between the entrance and exit is 62 meter the turbine develops 12.25 megawatt this is the power developed by the turbine the flow rate through the turbine is 12 meter cube per second so flow rate is 12 meter cube per second for a net head of 115 meter, net head is 115 meter, find the following. So, problem is a long one, usually a Francis turbine problem gives so many data, so sometimes it is very long, but you will have to understand these things, what are the data giving that rotational speed, the flow velocity without whirl discharge, 7 meter per second is the absolute velocity of discharge, difference between the heads 
except the velocity head, the difference between the static and potential head is 62 meter, the net head 115 meter. So, this is the net head available, find the following. What are the following that you have to find out? The absolute velocity of water, these are the things that you will have to find out, absolute velocity of water at entry to the runner and the angle of the inlet guide vane, the absolute velocity of the water at entry to the runner and the angle of the inlet guide vanes. The entry angle of the runner blades, the entry angle of the runner blades and the loss of head in the runner, this you will have to find out. You have written the problem, let us solve the problem. Again, I am telling, if any difficulty, you just please, I repeat the thing. Well, have you completed? Yes. Now, again, I repeat, a Francis turbine has a diameter of 1.4 meter and rotates at 430 rpm. Water enters the turbine runner without shock with a flow velocity of 9.5 meter per second and leaves the runner without whirl with an absolute velocity of 7 meter per second. The difference between the sum of the static and potential heads at entrance to the runner and at the exit from it is 62 meter. The turbine develops 12.25 megawatt. The flow rate through the turbine is 12 meter cube per second for a net head of 115 meter. Find the following. What are the followings? The absolute velocity of water at entry to the runner and the angle of the inlet guide vanes, the entry angle of the runner blades and the loss of heat in the runner. So, let us find out that how we can solve the problem. Let us think of the velocity triangle. That means, if you consider the runner blade like this, if you remember this, the runner blade. So, So, please see that, that this is your u 1 inlet, this is v r 1 and this is v 1. So, this will be v f 1 that is the flow velocity at the inlet. So, therefore, this is u 1, u 1 is this one okay, and this is v w 1. So, immediately you will have to think in terms of the velocity triangle. The outlet velocity will be like this triangle, though this will be. Now, without whirl, it is already mentioned in the problem. So, therefore, V 2 and V f 2 is same and this is the U 2, which will be lower than the U 1 in a Francis turbine radial flow, inward radial flow turbine as you know and this is your V r 2. So, therefore, this angle is the angle of the blade at the outlet. This is the angle of the blade at the inlet beta 1 and this is the guide vane angles. Guide vane angles are always specified as the angle of the guide vane at outlet. That means, the angle at which the fluid leaves the guide vane or this is the angle of the absolute velocity of the fluid approaching the runner and all the angles are referred whenever we tell angle, we do not tell with what direction because it is always referred to the direction with the direction of the tangential velocity. That means, the tangent to the rotor at the point in the tangential direction. So, if this be the velocity triangle, now we what are the quantities and we know that we know u, u 1 we know. What is u 1? u 1 is pi have you calculated n d 1 by 60. So, it is given in the problem. Is it given in the problem? 430 rpm, so pi into 430 divided by 60, here n is the rpm and what is the di diameter of the runner? Has a diameter of 1.4 meter. Now, here there is a problem, that is why I like to point out the problem in particular. When this diameter of the runner is given, you will have to consider this diameter at the inlet diameter because it is not very explicit in its mathematical languages, the diameter is the inlet diameter or the outlet diameter, because the flow takes place with varying diameters, the radial flow machines. 
for a Pelton wheel or for an axial flow machine, so we mean diameter means that the mean diameter, where both the inlet and outlet is taking place. But here it is very difficult to know that whether it is the inlet diameter or outlet diameter. So, it is a convention that diameter of the radial turbine means the outlet diameter. In case of radial flow machines, diameter is the outlet diameter. So, it is very important thing. So, you find out u. What is the value of u? 31.52 meter per second. So, then what you will do? V w 2 is 0. So, what you will find out? Power given to the runner by the water, this power given, that means power available, power available or power developed, you can write by runner. What is the power developed by runner? It is rho into q into you know from the Euler turbine equation V w 1 u 1. So, u 1 we know, we know V w 1. How do you know V w 1? V w 1 we do not know, but we know the power developed that is 12.25, 10 to the power 6 and we get V w 1 as 32.25. 39 meter per second. Okay. V w 1 we get because we know that the turbine develops 12.25 megawatt. So, power developed by the turbine is rho q v w. Here also mechanical efficiency we take to be 100 percent because this power developed is the final power developed and this V w 1 u 1 is the power developed by the runner. So, we consider the mechanical efficiency when the mechanical efficiency is not given, we can consider this to be 1 and we can find out V w 1. So, now it is easy to find out the alpha 1. So, when we know the V w 1, so we can find out the alpha 1 because we know the flow velocity at the inlet is 9.5 meter per second. That means, V f 1 is equal to 9.5 meter per second. So, we can calculate tan alpha 1 is 9.5 divided by 32.39 and this comes to be not tan alpha, alpha 1 comes to be 16.35 degree. Check it. Now, how to find out tan that beta 2 or beta 1 which we will have to find out please tell me which we will have to found, find out the at n t to the runner and the angle at n t to the runner that means this beta 1 that means we will have to find out beta 1. How to find out beta 1? If I write tan beta 1 is V f 1 by very good V w 1 minus u 1. So, you know V f 1, you know V w 1, you know u 1. V w 1 you know since you know this alpha 1. So, V w 1 is V 1 cos alpha 1. So, this will give you a value of beta 1 is equal to 84.77 degree. All right. So, next is the head loss to the runner. We have to find out. Okay. Now, we see that total head, now head loss to the runner, how to find out head loss in the runner. This is the last thing that you will have to find out. What are the things? We have found out absolute velocity of water at entry, the angle of the inlet guide vanes and runner vanes, the entry angle of the runner blades, the loss of head in the runner. So, now loss of head in the runner, how can you find out? Loss of head can be found out written like that, head across the runner. across the runner that means available head. This terminology you have to understand very clearly available head, head across the runner is equal to work head, work head means that is the work produced per unit weight that means the head equivalent to work plus the head loss. Now, head across the runner available head is the difference of head between inlet and outlet that means if I give the suffix one as inlet and suffix two at the outlet from the runner. That means, the head available is this is the inlet head 
which comprises the static head that is the pressure head, the kinetic head, the velocity head and the potential head minus well P 2 by rho g plus V 2 sorry, sorry, sorry very good z and what is this V w 1 in this case there is no whirl tangential component of velocity this is h l rather head loss. So, these things are clear. We have been given that this head available, what is the value? Head available to the runner. So, we can find out this thing from a different way that we know this P 1 by rho g minus P 2 by rho g plus z 1 minus z 2 rather we can take P 1 by rho g plus V 1 square minus V 2 square by 2 g is equal to the right hand part dimension. Now, this is given as 62 meter, 62 meter. Well, this is given as 62 meter. So, this part we can calculate from our velocity triangle. We can calculate, we, we have already calculated V 1, have we not? We have not calculated V 1, no, so far. So, uh, V 1 we have calculated. So, we know the value of V 1, we can calculate the V 2 also. How we can calculate the V 2? V f 1 is equal to V 2, very good, V f 1 is equal to V f 2 is equal to V 2. So, if we know both V 1 and V 2 from the velocity triangle with the trigonometric relations, then I can find out the net head across the runner. Well, this thing is already calculated, this thing is already known to us. So, we can find out H l. So, ultimately if you calculate the H l will come to 13.49 meter. All right, this we have already calculated earlier 32.39, this is 32.39, what is that? Into 31.52 divided by 9.8, this is V w 1, this is U 1. So, plus h l. Okay. So, this way we can solve this problem. Next, we come to another problem. This is another interesting problem. This you can take it. Francis Turbine, quick, you write this problem. Huh? time is up okay this problem the diameter of the runner 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 of a vertical shaft turbine the diameter of the runner of a vertical shaft turbine you please write this problem is 450 millimeter is 450 millimeter at the inlet the diameter of the runner of a vertical shaft turbine is 450 millimeter at the inlet the width of the runner at inlet, the width of the runner at inlet is 50 millimeter, is 50 millimeter. The diameter 50 millimeter, the diameter and width at the outlet are, the diameter and width at the outlet are 300 millimeter, are 300 millimeter and 75 millimeter respectively. 30, 300 millimeter that means the diameter and width at the outlet are 300 millimeter and 75 millimeter respectively. This is the diameter, this is the width. Well, the blades occupy next is that the blades occupy 8 percent of the circumference which will give you the idea about the flow area. So, flow area is not the entire circumference times the width the blade occupy 8 percent of the circumference stop. The guide vane angle is 24 degree which is alpha 1 that is the angle of the absolute velocity at the entrance to the turbine. The guide vane angle is 24 degree. 
the inlet angle of the runner blade is 95 degree. Well, the inlet angle of the runner blade is 95 degree and the outlet angle is 30 degree and the outlet angle is 30 degree. The fluid leaves the runner, the fluid leaves the runner without any whirl, the fluid leaves the runner without any whirl. The pressure head at inlet is 55 millimeter above that at exit. The pressure head at inlet is 55 millimeter above that at exit from the runner. The fluid friction, the fluid friction losses, the fluid friction losses account for <coughs> sorry, 18 percent of the pressure head at inlet. <coughs> the fluid friction losses account for 18 percent of the pressure head at inlet. Calculate the speed of the runner and the output power. Calculate the speed of the runner and the output power. Well, calculate the speed of the runner and the output power. You write another problem for this is the last one, axial flow hydraulic machine. Quick. An axial flow hydraulic turbine, you have to be a little fast in writing because time is short. An axial flow hydraulic turbine has a net head of 23 meter across it. Axial flow hydraulic turbine has a net head of 23 meter across it. And when running at a speed of 150 rpm develops 23 megawatt. That is the power developed, that is the net head across the turbine and running at a speed of 150 rpm. The blade tip and half diameters, which is very important here, the blade tip and half diameters are 4.75 and 2.0 meter respectively. That means, the tip and half diameter determines the flow area because here the flow is axial, axial flow turbine. The blade tip and half diameters are 4.75 2.0 meter respectively, but inlet and outlet is through the entire height of the blades to the entire diameter. That means, it is not a radial flow machine. If the hydraulic efficiency is 93 percent and the overall efficiency 85 percent, calculate the inlet and outlet blade angles at the mean radius assuming axial flow at outlet assuming axial flow at outlet. The entire flow through the turbine is axial, assuming axial flow at outlet. All right. So, you please try this problem. Next class, if you have any difficulty in solving the problems, we can discuss before starting the new topic pumps, rotodynamic pumps. So, next class, I will discuss the rotodynamic pumps, but I have given you these two problems, one problem I have solved, other two problems which I have given you, you please try to your hall. So, if you have any difficulties, next class we will discuss about this and then we will start the new topic rotodynamic pumps. Okay. Thank you.